Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining our webinar. As you join the Zoom room and as we wait for everyone to kind of join us, we'd love for you to share in the chat where you're joining us from and um, what you're hoping to gain from today's presentation as we focus on how to structure impactful school garden professional development. We'd love to know where you're coming from and what you hope to gain from today's presentation. We'll just let a couple more people join us here so that um, we get started. But my name is Tristana Perkle, and I'm the executive director of the School Garden Support Organization Network, or the SGSO Network. If you're just meeting us for the first time, we are a global peer-to-peer -peer net peer-to-peer learning network for school garden professionals, supporting folks at any level from the individual garden educator to those who lead statewide or regional networks. As a part of our mission, we seek to create platforms where we, where you, our members, share your expertise with one another. Our, web, our webinars are one way in which we do that. And today we're bringing you a deep dive in how to structure impactful professional development for providing education in a school garden. We've got speakers from two areas of the country today sharing how they do it. Ashley Fine of Skyview School and Sarah Reville of Prescott Unified School District, both in Prescott, Arizona. And Ashley Ratanet Juan and Ali Arnold of the Friends of the National Arboretum in Washington, DC. So just for a couple of housekeeping items, if you could please go to the next slide. Um, the session will be recorded. A link to the recording will be shared via email to all registrants in about a day or two. And it will also be housed on our recording library. We've compiled a resource handout for this webinar, which I'm gonna put into the chat um, in just a moment uh, with all of our relevant links, including a link to the presentation slides. Um, I'll put that in the chat in just a second. So this webinar will be for an hour and 15 minutes. The first hour will be dedicated to presentations by our speakers, and then we'll have the last 15 minutes for questions. As questions come up for you, please share them in the Q&A section of your Zoom screen. It's easier for us to organize them there if you submit them over the chat, just so that you all can continue to chat in the chat box. Um, and then finally, your feedback is so very helpful. We'd really appreciate if you filled out this survey after the webinar. Um, it'll also pop up on your screen once the webinar ends. It really helps us to know how we're doing, you know, how this webinar was for you, but also what topics you'd like to learn about for future webinars. So really appreciate your time and filling that out. So if you go on to the next slide, want to make sure that you know about the Growing School Garden Summit. The dates have been set for 2024. This um, gathering is for school gardeners all over the country and some parts of the world, hosted by the Sprouts Healthy Communities Foundation in partnership with Life Lab and uh, the SGSO Network. And on the next slide, we're, we're um, making sure that you know that our scholarship applications are now open through June 28th. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. That way we can make sure folks have the, the data. Awesome, thank you. So we are prioritizing scholarships for Black, Indigenous, and Latinx people of color, as well as young and emerging leaders, which we define as being under 30 or with five years or less of experience in garden-based education. But we will also take into consideration other identities and life experiences that are often underrepresented, underrepresented and and or marginalized in the field of garden education. So that, if that pertains to you, please um, submit an application by June 28th. And then next slide, um, we are also, our call for pre presentations is also open and will be until July 31st. We've got all sorts of different types of sessions, workshops, lesson cooking demos, demos short courses, light talks and field trips that you can um, submit presentations for. And then next slide, um, something that we also do as a part of our network is create opportunities for you to gather with one another, network with each other, meet each other at different gatherings around the country um, and throughout the year. And so we will be at the National Children and Youth Garden Symposium that's in July. And we're organizing a school gardener gathering and dinner on the evening of July 13th. So if you'll be at that gathering, look for details. Um, we'll be sharing that via our email and Google forum. So the next slide kind of shares a little bit about, um, you know, diving into what this presentation is all about. The, pres the presenters from today's presentation are from the 
2022 School Garden Support Organization Leadership Institute. Um, this is an institute hosted annually by Life Lab and Whole Kids Foundation in partnership with the SGSO Network for leaders of school garden support organizations, which we define as an entity that supports multiple school gardens. And the focus of the 2022 Institute was on entities that are either district wide or staffed by individuals at the district level and have a particular focus of improving the professional development. There were about 24 organizations and almost 50 people. Um, and as a part of the Institute, the participants have pledged to share their findings and their learnings with our greater network, hence our, um, hence this webinar and the previous two webinars that we had um, in April and May, all about district-wide school garden programs. So if you missed those, go check those out. But today we are focusing all on how to structure impactful professional development with examples from our presenters. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to um, Sarah. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I want to start off by uh, thanking SGSO for inviting me to speak today. And we're honored to share what we have learned in the process of forming, forming a professional learning community. I want to start off this presentation the way Ashley and I always begin our PLC gatherings, and that is by acknowledging the ancestral and current homeland of the Yavapai Prescott tribe as the place that Ashley and I live and conduct our professional learning community. Secondly, I would like to give credit to SGSO, the Leadership Institute that Ashley and I attended this winter. And this in institute was really transformational in our work and gave Ashley and I both a renewed sense of energy and excitement and courage to share what we have learned with others. At the institute, we got to experience what it was like to be in a PLC. Our experience was profound and Ashley and I knew we had a responsibility to share the valuable resources and knowledge we were gifted. The information that we have in our presentation today is nothing that has not been done before, but we are excited to share our experience with you all today on what it was like to form a PLC using the tools that we learned from the Institute. Next slide. So with that said, I'd like to introduce myself and Ashley and share a little bit about how we came together as a team. And you all will get to hear from Ashley later on in the presentation. But my name is Sarah Reville and my pronouns are she, her. I am the firm school coordinator for the Prescott Unified School District in Arizona. We have seven schools and 10 edible gardens, which serve around 4,000 preschool through high school students every year. Our farm to school program took root in 2014 and has been growing bigger ever since. Ashley Fine's pronouns are she, her, and she is the school garden coordinator at Skyview School, which is a separate school district in our community. Skyview has 250 kindergarten through eighth grade students and multiple garden spaces all over the school campus that are used for core academic instruction. The school garden program at Skyview started in 2010. Ashley has been doing school garden work for about 16 years as an academic teacher. I started my work in the field of school garden education as an AmeriCorps VISTA for PUSD three years ago. Ashley became a full-time garden educator in 2021, and my VISTA service became a full-time district employed position in 2022. Having a full-time district employed person dedicated to school gardens in Arizona is actually quite unique compared to other parts of the country. So Ashley and I were grateful to lean on each other in this new era of our work in school gardens. And our local chapter of Slow Food International is really how Ashley and I formally developed a partnership and decided to attend the SGSO Institute as a team. And it has been a huge honor to work with Ashley, and I could not have accomplished any of this without her. Next slide, please. Slow Food International is a grassroots organization that started in 1986 with local chapters in 160 countries with over a million members. 
The philosophy of this organization is to envision a world in which all people can access food that is good, clean, and fair. Slow Food works towards this goal in many ways, including school garden education. Our professional learning community operates under Slow Food Prescott and is made up of 62 school garden educators and over 30 schools and organizations in our region. And the name that we have titled our professional learning community is Central Arizona Learning Garden Collective. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what is our purpose? Above all, our purpose is to work together to help students thrive. And we achieve this by fostering relationships between school garden educators and community partners so that ideas, strategies, lessons, and best practices can be shared. Energy and excitement for our work in school gardens can be renewed and to connect one another to local and national resources. Next slide. Before we delve into the specific strategies and tools we use at our professional learning gatherings, I will give a brief overview. This is the first year that Ashley and I have started organizing school garden gatherings, and we are definitely learning as we go. One of the great things about our PLC is how responsive we've made it and has allowed us to, uh, time and space to improve. Um, we will go more in depth about our response responsive model um, that we've adopted later on in this presentation. But as I mentioned before, this endeavor was really sparked by the 2022 SGSO Institute and the valuable resources, tools, and community that we discovered there. We have decided to host a school garden gathering once a season in the winter, spring, summer, and fall. And each of our gatherings take place in a different location, depending on who is co-facilitating with us. And as for who, Ashley and I coordinate with different community partners in the region to co-facilitate and host these gatherings. This provides participants the opportunity to network and learn from a variety of people and topics. And the thorough responses that we receive from the surveys we conduct at the end of each of our gatherings is what is used to determine the needs and requests of our community and what we decide to organize our next gathering on. It is only when we receive these responses that we decide what community organization and guest presenters would be best to co-host future gatherings. Next slide. At our first gathering, just two months after we attended the Leadership Institute, we asked our audience if they would be interested in forming a professional learning community in which different members and organizations in our community share their knowledge and skills with everyone. And we were pleased to find how receptive and enthusiastic everyone was and, and all that wanted to contribute. Uh, the co-host model we have adopted has really been the reason why this effort has been has become something Ashley and I can sustainably manage. Um, our co-host model has allowed for shared leadership and workload, opportunities to hear different voices and perspectives, created valuable space for networking, and the chance to see different garden spaces and models throughout the region. Next slide. Each of our gatherings have been very unique, as you might imagine, with different presenters and locations and topics covered. However, these four components on this slide are consistent with how we structure all of our gatherings and ensure that we stay true to our purpose and goals. We start off with uh, every gathering with structured and unstructured time for participants to socialize. We couple this time with food so that our guests feel nurtured and rejuvenated at these gatherings. And I'll discuss exactly what the structured time for socializing and networking looks like later on. Um, but then we move on to the topic of the gathering with present presentations and activities led by whoever our co-host is. Next, we always make time for a solution session, which is one of the things that Ashley and I learned at the Institute and has been the most requested aspect of our gatherings. 
allowing people to brainstorm solutions together is equally valuable to the presentations that we have prepared at these gatherings. Our participants are broken up into a different small group each time so that they have the opportunity to meet new people and hear new ideas and solutions. And lastly, we have experienced great success by factoring in time for participants to complete a survey during the gathering period. And only when they turn in their survey do they get to see if they won a raffle prize. And this has led to 99% that participation in our surveys, which is awesome. Next slide. So if you are planning to give a professional development training and or form a professional learning community, here is a sample schedule that may be useful. After hosting these gatherings um, of varying lengths a couple of times, we have discovered this schedule here on the slide. Um, taking place over the course of two hours to be the most effective for our PLC. And we can come back to this slide if you want to record that. But next slide, so sample icebreakers. Now, uh, to give you an idea of what our structured time for socializing looks like at the beginning of our gatherings, we have a couple of icebreakers we'd like to share with you. We always have new participants joining us each time, and it is helpful for people who have met to be reacquainted with each other and um, with structured time for networking. The icebreaker in the red box on the slide is great for participants to do while they're waiting in line for food or while they eat. Participants are given a slip of paper when they arrive with brief prompts on it. The first prompt asks you to introduce yourself to the people you are around by saying your name and your pronouns and the organization you're with. The second prompt asks you to share your favorite thing to do or teach in the garden. The third prompt asks you to explain one thing you are hoping to gain from the gathering. And then the icebreaker in yellow has participants pick up a book from a table flip through the pages, and when they find something interesting, share it with another person, and then exchange books with them. The books can be about the subject of the gathering or gardening in general. This is a helpful way to get ideas and thoughts flowing and encourages discussion with multiple people. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Ashley Fine from here. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm Ashley, and um, I just appreciate Sarah's introduction. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep rolling along with our presentation. Um, I want to take a little bit of time just to describe this solution session because it's just become a really valuable tool. It's really simple, and yet it's really powerful. And as Sarah mentioned, this was something that we did at the SGSO Institute. And so I'm just going to describe it here. So the goal is to get people into small groups of approximately four people. We used some color paint chips from the hardware store to help randomize the making of groups so people really mixed up and talked to each other. And after introducing um, people to each other, people succinctly would describe in a sentence a challenge or a problem that they were facing. And then the other group members listening in would offer ideas and solutions for that person. So it's just a great way to share ideas, offer support, share um, like experiences with each other. And this is something that people really valued and found super useful. Um, and so we're really trying to incorporate this solution session into all of the gatherings that we do. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about surveys and first just a little bit about format and then go into content. Uh, one thing that we've used to gather survey information is the Padlet. And this is something that I used a lot as a classroom teacher during the pandemic. And something that's really helpful with a Padlet is just that it's really easy to create and it's pretty easy to use as well. And it's nice because it gathers information synchronously and organizes it. So all of it is just showing up at once. And it's really nice to be able to go back to and see people's responses all in one place. 
it can be a little challenging to do it on a phone versus on a laptop or computer screen. So um, some folks don't necessarily love interacting with it if they only have a phone. So we suggest having both paper version of a survey and a Padlet um, available. And the other thing just to be aware of is if somebody signs into a Padlet with a QR code or just a link that it doesn't always automatically record their name or email. And so if you're trying to get very specific responses of like who has something they'd like to teach or facilitate at the next meeting and you don't know who that was <laughs> and you can't match the response, it can be a little challenging. So just be aware of that. Even if you ask people to remember to put their, excuse me, their name, then they may not do that. So that's just one downside with the Padlet. Um, another thing is just having a paper survey is really good if you're doing something outdoors. Like we had a garden educator gathering at an outdoor learning facility with very little Wi-Fi. And so we had to use a paper version there and just remembering to have clipboards and pens. And the only downside to that is that it takes time later on to go through those papers and then organize them digitally. Next slide, please. So just going into the content, um, I'm first just gonna kind of zoom in onto these questions that are on the left side of the slide and highlight three of them that we found in our planning just were most useful. And these are so simple. I mean, these are very basic questions, but they are just so useful. And the one thing that we really love is to ask people what their expertise is and what they have to share, because then for us, then we can know who we can ask to be facilitators or co-hosts as we move along in the future. And the other two questions that are really beneficial are simply, what do you need help with? And what would you like to learn about? And it's really in looking specifically at what people are saying, that's when we then go and plan our next session. So please know, of course, taking a survey and asking for this very basic information is not unique or groundbreaking, everyone does it, but it's really the intentionality behind how we're gathering the information so that we're using it to really formulate the content of what we're doing. Next slide. So Sarah and I were having a conversation and we were just speaking in metaphors and talking just about our own hopes and goals as organizers and we, we kind of discuss this, that as organizers, our intention is to water roots and nurture the soil. We're not deciding what to plant in our community. We're just trying to create a space that encourages things to grow. Next slide. So continue with the idea of encouraging things. We all know that sometimes it can be challenging to get very overworked, very busy teachers to sign up and show up for things. And so these are just some built-in incentives that we have been providing for people. Uh, the first one is something that's just dear to my heart and that is providing food because we know folks at the time we're scheduling these are coming right after work and they're hungry and they're tired and trying to think of all the things that they need to do for the end of the day. And so just to know that there's going to be food there just can be really helpful. So at our very first gathering, we actually provided a whole dinner for people. Um, this photo is, of my super precious students doing some prep work. And then we passed all the cut vegetables along to a chef who worked with local slow food volunteers to make a big pot of soup. And we had homemade cookies and homemade bread. And it just was a really sweet way to bring people in and share with them. Another thing as Sarah mentioned is just our raffle prizes. And again, these are things we either had for free or got donated, nothing very expensive but it was just nice to have these little giveaways and things that people could really use like seeds and tools and farmer's market tokens. And as Sarah mentioned, we really tried to link people turning in their survey to being part of the raffle. And that just got people to respond really well. And it was just kind of fun. And then um, we offer professional development. And another thing that um, we try really hard to do at our meetings is offer childcare. So hire a babysitter who can be there for a couple of hours so that people can, it's more realistic for people to attend. Next slide. Um, just briefly a little bit about how we're communicating and outreaching. And um, this is probably an area we could stand to improve in, but I just wanna point out one thing we've been using to invite people to our gatherings is 
simply an evite invitation and we're just using the free version i'm sure there's a lot of better ways <laughs> to do this but there are things that we actually really like about the evite invitation one is just that automatic rsvp function that's coming to us really easily people can change their rsvp status it, we can schedule automatic reminders to people. So if we get busy with things, we know it's going to go out a couple days before and even the day of to remind people about it. And um, just gathering some basic information, people can also respond that they're excited to come or ask a question. And so that's actually just been a great tool for us to use. And then we also have just been reaching out to people in a real personal manner. So making a phone call to somebody we think would value being there or Something that I've appreciated doing is just setting up personal meetings with people, um, taking time to like meet with the people from our cooperative extension office or a manager of a grocery store and just telling them what we're up to, inviting them in to become part of our group, seeing what resources they have to share and maybe possibly even being presenters at a future gathering. And then beyond that, we're just trying to really help people network with each other. So making sure that our contact lists are growing and that they're available to everybody who's participating so that if conversations are being had, people can continue those conversations and reach out and learn more from one another. Next slide. Um, a lot of this has really been addressed so far. Um, so I won't go into detail, but I think that nurturing our community is at the heart of what we really want to do. We know as garden educators and educators in general that people are working so hard. People are giving their time, tending things, have a lot of responsibility, and to make our gatherings a time for people to recharge and reconnect and get energized again is really at the heart of what we hope to do. And so that's part of how we learned that having enough time is important. We don't wanna make it too long where people feel like they're stuck for a long time at something, but we also know it needs to be long enough so that conversations can be had, people can spend time in a garden space that they're not in charge of taking care of, <laughs> that can feel really healing and nurturing. So um, that's really an important part of what we do. In addition to just really connecting each other with resources, not only at the meetings, but then in between meetings. So for example, Sarah had a local nursery give a whole bunch of flowers and she was able to distribute them to a lot of teachers throughout the community. And um, I was able to help make these grab and grow seed bags from a bunch of seeds that were donated to Slow Food Prescott. And so we were able to give dozens of garden educators just bags full of seeds to get started with their gardens this spring. And it just feels really good to be able to connect people with the things they need to help them sustain their gardens and also just get gardens started in general. Next slide. So as with any project or process, it's just really valuable to pause and reflect along the way. And again, we're still really new at this, but um, some things that we've already been learning, um, as mentioned before, two hours feels like a good meeting length. Um, some other things that we're learning is probably having a social media presence would be helpful just as another line of communication. And there are quite a few people who've attended that are really new to school garden education. And so they're really requesting more detailed how-to things so we're listening to that feedback and at some of our upcoming gatherings, we're going to be really modeling lessons, giving people lesson plans and really showing them how they can actively engage their students in gardening work. And um, I think one thing in terms of just what feels like it's going right, as Sarah mentioned earlier, that just working together and having those collaborative partnerships really makes it not only manageable, but also really joyful. And so it has been really fun being able to work with a lot of other people as, as well as Sarah. And so it is one extra thing to continue to track and do, but it's also been um, restorative and a lot of fun because there's so much sharing of the work and sharing of the tasks. So I feel like that's one piece that feels really successful with what we're doing. And as um, Tristana mentioned, there's resources available, but our email contacts are both here on this slide. So if you have any thoughts, questions, suggestions for us, or 
just want to continue the conversation, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to chat with you. And that's it. So I'm actually now going to turn it over to Allie Arnold from the Friends of the National Arboretum. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Sarah. Um, that was beautiful. Um, so much wisdom that you guys both shared there. Um, we're going to now shift into talking about our multi-day professional development over the summer, um, the collaborative back-end process for how we plan for it, and what it looks and feels like through the lens of re responsive training strategies um, when working with adult learners. So I'm Allie Arnold. Um, I went to UVA. I've been growing uh, food for over eight years. I'm a food course service member alum. Um, at, I'm currently working at the service site I served at, um, and I've been here for five years supporting school gardens in DC. I'll just take a second to introduce myself too. I'm Ashley Artinet One. I'm also a school garden program manager at Friends of the National Arboretum. I'm from Georgia. Go dogs! If any dogs are here, I've done AmeriCorps. I was a teacher for a while, garden coordinator, and now I'm here at the Arboretum. Um, and I've been here like two, almost three years now. Okay, I'll just go ahead and give kind of an overview of our programming just to ground our conversation. Um, the Friends of the National Arboretum is the nonprofit partner of the National Arboretum. So our um, biggest part is the Washington Youth Garden, which is a one acre garden at the National Arboretum. Um, and part of that is our school garden support program. Um, our program is intended to work with school staff instead of doing all of the work ourselves. So we look to try to build up school staff and giving them tools and structures to help them be successful and run sustainable garden programming at the school, kind of to combat the turnover and all of the other things that are happening in our schools. And just to give a quick numbers about our program, we work with about 12 different schools. This is from last year, but we work with 12 different schools. Um, 36 teachers, 103 students, um, tons of work days and events. We do seasonal trainings, cohorts, and the focus of this is our multi-day professional development. Um, just to give some more grounding, so we're going to be talking about our Summer Institute for Garden-Based Teaching, which we'll talk more in depth in this session um, and how we structure that. But the Summer Institute for Garden-Based Teaching is lays the groundwork for the rest of our programs. Um, it primarily flows straight into our educator coaching program, which is our school year long program where schools can get more individualized support throughout the school year. And they can get all of these other things, field experiences, co-teaching, in-depth coaching, and all this fun stuff. But it all starts with our Summer Institute. And like I said, laying that foundational work. That is right. And 2023 will be our sixth year running the Summer Institute. Our program director, shout out Brianne, she's on the call, started this training in 2018. Um, we had an existing partnership program called Garden Science, where schools would ideally graduate after three to five years, um, but some schools were still on in years eight and nine. Um, she would get emails from teachers at schools who had graduated from our program that had a WIG sign in their garden and they would be asking for support. And so she realized that there was a need for this um, in DC. Um, and so it's for, it started as our kind of a program for our alumni schools, but it also is really for schools that have been running school gardens for a while and just need that guidance and connection, or maybe they have the infrastructure, but no one is actually teaching or using it any, anymore. Uh, and since the beginning, the Summer Institute has always focused on building out a team at the school to prevent that school garden champion issue of one person running the whole garden and then they leave and the whole garden program goes with them. Um, and our goal is also to really connect the school staff and volunteers to other resources in DC so that school garden programs can really be connected to this resilient um, network of support. And it's funded primarily through grants, um, through OSSI, our Office of State Superintendent of Education, um, as well as a USDA uh, service learning grant. So some quick numbers, uh, it's four days. Um, and from 2022, there were 31 participants from 12 schools facilitated by 4.5 full-time uh, 
staff members. Um, we planned it over six months. We had 17 um, school staff, actual teachers to facilitate, uh, as well as nine um, community-based organizations and support organization facilitators. Okay, just to give an idea of how long this takes, the short answer is six months. Um, with a small staff um, of 4.5 people working on this, and of course, facilitators both inside and outside of the organization, um, it starts in January, and actually we're in the midst of planning our Summer Institute in July. So right now we're in the June category, preparing for um, the Summer Institute with sessions, materials, um, and logistics. So you can see that this kind of thing just takes a long time, even though it is only a four day um, intensive. So just some of the back end stuff for how the planning works behind and how we really work to incorporate that feedback, which I'm sure is like a constant theme now with the first part of the presentation, we're talking about feedback and how important it is to um, center your participants in what you're planning. Um, our planning process is essentially one huge Google um, Excel sheet um, with everything that we have there. So all of the people that are collaborating on this project can see everything that's going on in real time and everyone is able to access it. And on the pictures on the side are just an example of some of the planning sheets of like the day of and the pre-work that goes into how much detail we have to do so everyone knows and is on the same page with things. Um, and we do have a collaborative planning process throughout the school year from that January to June, just so everyone is on the same page and we're hitting everything that we want using our logic model, which I'll show in a second, but our logic model provides that structure and groundwork um, for all of the sessions and we really focus it in the outcomes that we want. Um, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but our um, logic model was focused, done by um, focus groups, by an outside evaluator, from folks that we work with, other partners, and really the teachers, the parents, and the students that are gonna be participating in this. So all of our outcomes come from our findings from that focus group. Just about incorporating feedback in our participants, part of this process is reviewing all of the feedback from previous years. I'll give you a chance later on to see what our um, planning process and brainstorm process looks like, but we really do look at all of the feedback to inform what we're gonna be doing in this next year. And then considering our experience of our adult participants and definitely feeling that we have to take care of them and make sure that um, they're ready to do this. And we also, like I said, like to share um, and utilize a mix of presenters, um, teachers that we work with currently, folks that have come in the past so they can still participate in the community, um, other school garden support um, organizations, other nonprofits. We just have a bunch of different presenters to be able to pull this off. Um, and this is the logic model that I was talking about, but like I said, this was, um, kind of came by our focus group done by evaluators. And just to give an example, um, we are looking at educators interested in experiential learning. Um, we want them to connect this work to K-12, NGSS, and Common Core. And then the outcome is our session, getting creative with curriculum. So how we go from what we want and then the session that is the outcome of that. And that kind of changes year to year too. Um, this is part of our collaborative planning. So this is actually a Canva that we made. And in this Canva, um, it's linked in here. So when you look at the slides, you can go and look at the full thing, but there are different logistics feedbacks. We asked for like feedback on every single session. So everyone on the team has the chance to provide feedback on everything that we've done, um, especially if they're only interacting with certain parts of the schedule. So this is um, just part of our feedback and collaborative planning process. Um, part of our application, um, this is our advertisement and flyer for this current year. Our recruitment process is pretty extensive. I think this year we only um, want 30 to 40 participants. This year we had, I think, 70, almost 80 applications. Um, but we recruit and do a very intensive outreach to both our former and current 
partner schools because we really want to build garden teams there to strengthen the model of teams having ownership over gardens. We send it out to other SGSOs in our network, um, local listservs, like all kinds of things, our own personal school garden listserv. It's also linked there if you want to learn more about quarterly resources in the garden. Um, in addition, we do have incentives for folks to join. Um, PLUs are something that folks can get, but people usually go for the stipend. Um, there's an individual stipend for every participant that comes, as well as a garden program stipend if they bring a team, because once again, we're really trying to reinforce um, the team instead of just doing a garden champion or like a garden coordinator, so folks can really have a strong team at their schools. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, uh, if you participate in Summer Institute, then they can also apply for additional support through our educator coaching program, which is year long. So whatever they started in the Summer Institute, they can continue working on through their year long um, program. Yeah. So I will take you through the day by day schedule to share what it looks and feels like and really highlight what responsive training strategies we use. Um, hopefully you're not overwhelmed by our slides with our <laughs> Google Sheets photos in here. Um, so the first day is really laying the groundwork. Um, and the first responsive training strategy I want to share is that adults come with a wealth of experience and knowledge ready to share and learn more. Um, and so recognizing and encouraging participants to share their knowledge and skills really is motivating um, and it also builds an atmosphere of mutual respect. And it provides opportunities for participants to learn from each other. Um, and we do this through um, getting to know our audience uh, through our application questions. Um, we also do icebreakers, like high five someone who teaches the same grade as you, and then they'll answer a question um, or fist bump someone who has grown a tomato. Um, and they might, again, answer another question that we have as our icebreaker. I also really explicitly share in the beginning that I don't know anything or I don't know everything, <laughs> um, but together we know a lot. Um, so if a presenter is sharing about something that maybe you as a participant have done before, you know, please share. We really want to hear it. Um, and there's time built in the, to the agenda for you to share your questions and ideas. And we also often ask them to share their own learning goals in our application as well, so we can get to know more about them and what they want to know. So we, here are some pictures from day one. Um, we do our garden agreements together. Um, we uh, also, you can see there's binders um, and we supply notebooks. Um, and uh, paper for note taking. So the second responsive training strategy I want to share is that people are most receptive when they feel well taken care of. Um, so we really try to plan breaks. We include snacks and beverages each day. We saw the water cooler we have out every day. Um, and if we're there all day, we'll provide lunch. Um, and this year we are doing all day in-person sessions. So we're providing lunch every single day. Um, we'll have sunscreen, bug spray, first aid available, really make it, being mindful that it's hot outside in DC summer, um, over 90 degree heat sometimes. We um, got mini spray fans. Participants really shared that, that they were really grateful for that. And this day two, we did garden field trips. And we realized that four schools was a bit too much for the day. So we're moving to three schools um, this year. And it's really important to start and end on time. And even better if you can give them a little time back and end early. Um, here are some pictures. They made a Greek salad with one of our um, nonprofit partners, Fresh Farm. Uh, they harvested at another school garden and got to take it home. So day three, um, variety really helps people stay engaged. As you all know, probably working with students, you try to mix up that bodily kinesthetic, the interpersonal, the interpersonal, the musical, um, logical, mathematical, you get it. So we really try to do that with this training as well. 
Um, and that first session in day three from last year, tried and true activities in the garden, um, really emphasizes that kinesthetic. So it really gets the participants hands on and they're actually doing the lessons that our partners and our teachers love to do with their students. So for example, one of the teachers made a hummus and the participants actually got to make that hummus together as if they were kids. And our uh, bee queen in DC, Tony, she had a, a wildflower seed ball activity where they could make it and then take it home connected to pollinators. We had root view cups, um, City Blossoms, another nonprofit partner had their loose parts play uh, box as well for show. And then day four, so my last um, responsive training strategy is people learn best when given opportunities to reflect on and practice or apply what they've learned. So um, they really, people really retain new information at a higher rate if they practice by doing and better yet, if they teach other people new information. I think this is one of the things that we could do even better on. And I'd really love to add more of that element with teachers actually trying out a lesson for each other in that why try apply approach. And all of these responsive training strategies are linked in our resource handout um, under the title working with adult learners. In the last day, we also um, include grade level brainstorming, logic model planning, and they also present on those goals um, that they came up with through their logic model planning. And they do kind of a gallery walk. Here's an example of one of the posters from one of the school teams that they presented on. And one of the most important things I like to say is just, you know, it can be really stressful to put on something like this, a really big professional development, but to just remember to be yourself, bring your personality into it, keep it silly, have fun, um, do your favorite plant yoga pose and take a picture, um, sing some songs. We did a whole, we did a save soil dance that one of the teachers led for us in the last day here. Um, so we love to, we began with feedback and we are going to end with more feedback. Um, so after our summer institute, um, folks get to fill out the very fun feedback forms. Um, and similarly to what folks were talking about earlier from Prescott, um, we kind of hold it hostage until people fill out their survey. When they fill out their survey, they can get their stipend. And that's really how we get folks to fill out our surveys to make sure that, uh, we're able to do that since the first survey that we send out is anonymous, so folks can, you know, say whatever they want. Um, we then link at the end of the first survey to another survey um, that just says what their name is, you know, the school and all the information so we can get their stipend to them. And that's just a way for us to be able to make sure that everyone is filling out the survey. Um, and we can also go back and, you know, cross-reference the attendance and be like, oh, this person has not filled it out because we really do value um, the feedback we get from this and we really change what we do in the following year based on the feedback that we're getting from this year. Um, and some of the ways that we use that feedback, I mean, one way is celebrating the wins, what is going great, what, thing, what things people love, what is valuable to our participants, and what things that we want to continue doing. Um, of course, what sessions we're going to use, what sessions that are um, we need to add. We kind of have a little catch of sessions that we can add in or take out based on like what we think folks are needing, um, what areas that we, we lack in. Um, one example is from our feedback last year, we heard that folks want more garden skill building. So we're going to add that in this year to do a garden 101. And that's just going to be very um, garden skills building for like novice gardeners, as well as having, you know, advanced skill building. So that's just the one way that we use that feedback. Um, who we partner with in the next year, like I said, this is kind of a pipeline to our educator coaching program. So we can see um, more about their schools, how they're looking. And then if we want to partner with them next year, 
um, as well as logistics for training. So for next year, it informs us when we're having the professional development, what time of the year works based on um, everyone's schedule, especially considering we work with many charters, public school districts um, that all have different school start dates as well as pre-service trainings. Um, and I will say, the one thing that has been really instrumental in making sure we use this feedback is making um, the information digestible instead of just looking at it in a back end of a Google form spreadsheet. Um, and all of these resources on the bottom are our feedback surveys and all that stuff that y'all can peruse, which will also be linked. Um, but this is just one way we do that. So like I said earlier, this is part of that really big Canva that I was talking about of how we brainstorm for the next year. And part of that is reviewing survey feedback. So one way that really makes it digestible is taking it and putting it in an aesthetically pleasing way um, so people can look at. And these are just one of the sides is just the um, logistics stuff. So when do people want the Summer Institute to be? What time of day works for them? all that kind of stuff. And this is just taken from the um, feedback that they've given and just put in a different form. And the other one is on the activity sessions. So it's literally just comments people have made, um, what kind of sessions um, do people like and their feedback about it. And that's for our team to review. Another example, most useful sessions, least useful sessions um, and the previous year so we can look at what things have been successful in the past and what things we want to continue. School garden tours are always something that are very popular. So we brought it back this year. But like Ali said, one of the things that we've done is take it from four schools to three schools because of just the exhaustion of being in the heat all day, as well as hearing that participant feedback that they were tired. And that's totally fair because we're out all day. And like I said, celebrating those wins. So like hearing all of these wonderful things that people have to say about our summer trading really um, makes it worth it to do, even though it is like this whole six month process to do, but people really respond well to our training um, and honestly kind of always want to come back. So, which is super positive for us to hear. And just our last sheet is our Google resource folder um, and our emails. If you ever want to reach out about running your own training or just want to brainstorm, our inboxes are open. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you, Ashley, Ashley, Sarah, and Allie. Um, we're now going to go over to our Q&A section, so if you all wouldn't mind turning your videos on, it'd be great to see you as we have you answer some questions from the audience. And then um, if I'm gathering some questions, both from some of the pieces that you wanted to get out of this webinar, um, as well as um, what you put into the Q&A section. So if more questions come up, please put them into the Q&A. We'll now spend the next kind of 15 minutes answering questions. Um, so the first one I have for you all are, um, what are ways you all offer appreciation or compensation to the co-host, any co-host that you have at your um, workshops and trainings? And feel free, anyone can kind of answer this. In fact, if you all have different ways, it'd be great to hear. I can answer this question. Uh, so the, the co-host model that Ashley and I have started with our um, Central Arizona Learning Garden Collective, Ashley and I both um, operate under Slow Food Prescott. So Slow Food has been able to fundraise for us, and that's how we get our funding to offer um, just a thank you gift to our uh, co-hosts. Um, so in our last gathering, we gave our co-host a, just a simple, like beautiful flower in a pot and a thank you card. Um, but with more fundraising, we hope to be able to offer them more. Um, but really it's, it's, um, beneficial for the co-host to collaborate with us on these presentations and these gatherings because it's good outreach for their organization and advertisement for what they do. And 
because they really are just trying to um, get in connection with our um, local educators. So that's been really beneficial for them. Um, I'll just share for our facilitators and whether they be teachers or outside organizations that are coming, uh, we typically offer like an hourly rate for them um, through our grant funding to be able to uh, pay for facilitators. So we have like a standard just um, hourly rate for them to be able to do this work. Um, and we're like really appreciative because it is like, you know, sometimes extra. Thank you, Ali. Yeah, it's 35 an hour. Um, and yeah. Great, thank you all. Um, this is for Ali and Ashley um, from Friends of the National Arboretum. Um, there are a couple of just kind of logistical questions for your workshop. So just gonna run through those. Um, does every participant receive the incentive? Yes, the well, you can only either do the stipend or a PLU. Most people go for the stipend, understandably. Um, and then the garden team stipend is only if you bring an extra like staff member. So you have to have more than one person. But the personal stipend that everyone gets that. Great, thank you. And for the four day training, um, saw that you switched to virtual in the afternoon. Did you find that format that format effective for engagement? I yeah, I like um I feel most people got on, but it was definitely um a like that transition time was a bit challenging. And so it was definitely a delay getting people on. Um and also people shared comments that they were just really tired um at that point. I think just like once they got home and then they logged on, it was like brains were really foggy at that point. Um, but Ashley, you can share more about why we're doing all in person this year. Um, it definitely was a um, COVID response to limit the amount of time, especially indoors. We do have an indoor um, at the Arboretum. We have a place that we can do indoor events. Um, but with COVID and all of that stuff, it was just safer to do a virtual at the time that we were um, putting on the Summer Institute with you know, thinking about everyone's safety and all that stuff. Um, so this year, now that we can be more inside, um, especially in the hot afternoons, we're trying to do an all day in person training just because it is more effective. Obviously, virtual is a great option for um, maybe some some different formats, but we just will lose some of the engagement, especially since we are giving folks like the um, DMV region is rather large. Some folks are driving like an hour to get home or finding like a spot, you know, to be able to access the training. So we are losing some time just with folks transitioning to somewhere they could um, do virtual. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then could you share again how the um, Institute, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm realizing, um, do you guys call it, uh, Pona, do you guys call your um, program the Institute? The Summer Institute. Okay, great, great. I was like, are they referring to the Leadership Institute? But I think they're referring to yours. Could you could you share how it's funded? Thanks. Yes, um, it's through Aussie government. Um, so they're the Office of State Superintendent of Education. And then our specific supply um, money for the, that school garden team, school garden program supply fund, if that makes sense is through USDA service learning. Great, thank you. And Aussie is kind of like the equivalent of a state's um, Department of Education. Um, so they right. they actually receive a lot of their funding through a sugar sweetened um, uh, beverage tax. Um, so that's a really great kind of a whole nother topic and great best practice to raise funding for your programming. And so through that, they receive funding that they're able to then share with their partners in their school garden and lots of other um, healthy um, and movement activities in the District of Columbia. So it's a great kind of best practice to, to look at for the future. Um, another question that we have for all of you, um, what do you find are the three most important topics to train on for new garden educators? 
it might be hard to narrow it down to three, but what, what would you say are your top three? I'll just jump in and say one of them. And that was the focus of our last garden educator gathering is just um, classroom, like a classroom management. Like how do you organize a whole bunch of kids working in a garden and what are some effective strategies for organizing your space, for getting kids attention, for um, just how to respond to things that come up. There's a lot of people that may not only be new to teaching, but then teaching outside is a whole nother ball of wax. And so um, that was one thing that was requested of us that we really chose to focus in on was just that management piece of working with kids outside. I would say, okay, I have two, but I'll let someone else say another, but the next one I would say would be like the tried and true activities that I was sharing about. So just like some solid lesson plans that are, they can like really just do simply um, and, you know, with all of the information that they might need to, um, to lead it. And ideally um, they actually get a chance to do it themselves and maybe even like teach it themselves to practice. You guys took the ones that I was going <laughs> to say, but I guess I'll say um, one thing is hard gardening skills and how to do it with students, um, kind of similarly to what Ashley and Allie were saying, but like um, teaching the presenter, facilitator, teacher themselves how to do it. Um, and then how do you do it with students in like an organized way? And like, how do you facilitate that with a group of students? I would just add one more. So this is less of a teaching uh, tool and more just like, how do we uh, help make school gardens sustainable? Um, particularly in Arizona, we have to do a lot of um, fundraising, fundraising and um, writing grants. Even our teachers have to do that in order to um, sustain their school gardens. Um, so we provide uh, grant writing resources and grants that we've had success with getting um, in our region with our attendees, and that seems to be really helpful. These are so great. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Um, this, this didn't necessarily come through as a question, but it came through as what someone is kind of hoping to learn. Um, and it was around where to direct a small professional development budget to make it most impactful. And I, I thought I'd ask you, you all, you know, if you had um, less funding, um, what would you choose to do? You know, knowing what you know, knowing what you've done and seeing what works and what doesn't work. If you had a small budget, what would you choose to do for your professional development? I think that's a really good question. We we have little to no budget. <laughs> what we're doing, <laughs> we're just kind of making it up as we go and trying to be as resourceful as possible, literally giving out seeds that we have saved or loofahs that kids have grown. But I really actually, I wrote this down in my own note, like I really appreciate giving back to the educators and I that you offer, for example, Allie and Ashley, a $35 stipend to the presenter. Cause I think taking care of the people who are at the heart of sharing and disseminating the information is really critical to keeping things going. And then, you know, beyond that, um, just making sure that you have a space and resources to accommodate your goals for whatever you're hoping that people will learn. But I think really zooming in on the people who are doing that important work and sharing their knowledge really is, is, pretty, it is pretty important. And I would love for us to be able to eventually get to a place where we could offer that kind of um, stipend or something for people who are presenting with us.
Yeah, I think um, we are fortunate that we have funding to be able to take care of our presenters and be able to like even offer stipends for the folks that come to the training. Um, I've definitely worked in organizations before where we had limited to no budget. Um, and so that sometimes comes out in the planning of this where people have to go, Ashley, we don't have to in-kind for everything. And I'm like, are you sure? You know, we have budget for this. But I think if we were to do this with a more limited budget would be to really cut down on the, maybe the amount of time we do this and really focus on community building. And then probably some combination of what Ashley and Sarah are doing um, in Arizona. So like maybe doing like a big summit like one day summit during the summer and then having like more community building throughout the school year. And then that can really help, you know, stretch your like in-kinding skills and all of that kind of stuff because you'll have more time to like prepare and not have to do like a big um, summer thing. So I think that would probably be my course of action. Great, thank you. Um, you all kind of shared this, but I'm just wondering if you could go a little deeper on, um, you know, just kind of entry points for partnering with teachers, um, especially for, you know, brand new ones that you're bringing in, um, just some tips or how you all approach how to meet them where they are and kind of provide value to what they're doing. Uh, maybe if they're kind of more brand new to teaching in the garden or teaching outside. Um, I can answer this question um, and feel free to jump in. Uh, so one way that we've found to be effective to get new teachers um, to turn out at our events is um, I just sent the event um, outreach to our district's professional development director. And so the teachers are used to be are used to receiving um, information from this person on professional development. Another thing is to make sure that they're aware that this professional development that we do counts towards the hours that are required um, for their teaching certificate. Um, that helps as well. And um, if it's a teacher that is really new to school, school garden education, but they're interested about it, they want to learn more, they want to see if they want to do it, um, I always tell teachers that you don't need to know everything there is to know about gardening before you get your kids out into the garden, because the most beautiful part about school garden education is to the problem solving and the learning alongside your students. It's really humbling for them. I'll, I'll tag on a little bit here. Um, one thing that Slow Food Prescott has done is this mentorship program, and it's not just for garden educators, but it's actually just for brand new gardeners in general in the community. So it's a pairing of um, mentor gardeners or experienced gardeners with brand new gardeners, and there's this check-in process to be able to ask questions or help people along just saying like, hey, it's May, and it would be a good time to start thinking about these things. And so I think like I've been able to, and I think Sarah has um, a mentee as well. We're both connected with other um, gardeners and garden educators as just one-on-one -on -one support so that we can help those people. And that's been really effective. And I think also just really helping people understand that there are such incredible resources out there. So helping people find the Life Lab website or the SGSO website and showing them that there are examples of really spelled out lesson plans that can really explain what you're going to say, what materials you're going to need, how long it's going to take to do an activity. I think dispelling the myth of the what you're going to do as an educator can really support people. And then like Ali was talking about like creating these opportunities for people to actually try facilitating these lessons with a group of adults or to at least go through the lesson themselves and see how it car carries out and think, how can I do this in my own setting with my kids and um, just to be a learner themselves and then flip the switch and imagine themselves leading an activity. But I think connecting to really tried and true, really great resources is 
dispels a lot of myths and helps people feel more comfortable and centered. Great, thank you both. I really love these best practices. Um, we'll do one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, for the Summer Institute folks, how do you rank applications in order to choose partic participants? What do you take into consideration? Great question. Um, I think when we are looking at applications, the first thing that we're looking at is how many applications from a school site are there? Um, that is one of the more important things because we are looking like our whole model is built around this team and building up teams of teachers. So the more applications, or at least if you have more than one, you're way more likely to be able to come into the uh, Summer Institute. Um, the other thing is we look at our partner schools so and our former partner schools, the other thing that we're trying to build is teams at them to be able to train people to then join the garden team and then you know keep, build, keep building that foundation at a school. So that's another thing we look at schools that we've worked in the past. Um, our previous model was building school gardens. So schools that you know, like we are legacy schools um, and people that we're currently working are prioritized also because we're currently working with them. Um, but like this year, we had a school that we were working with last year that has come back and finally is ready to build a team. So we look at stuff like that too, as well as, um, you know, is the school title one? Are we looking at schools all over the city? Like we want to be as diverse as we can be. Um, we have a pretty extensive application that kind of like they can talk about their garden and like who, who their partner is, um, all kinds of stuff. So we really kind of look at a holistic view of their garden to be able to make those decisions. But um, it is in the presentation, presentation link, so you can take a look at the type of questions that we ask. And sometimes even, are they attached to a school? Are they a school in DC? Because we get outside bit of that as well. Great. Well, thank you all so much, Ashley, Ali, uh, Sarah, and Ashley. Just really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Um, I It seems to me like a lot of what folks were interested in getting out of this webinar, they were able to receive tips, best practices, how-tos, um, and I hope you uh, are receiving and seeing all of the wonderful um, appreciations of you, of you all in the chat. Um, so thanks again for, for presenting. Thanks to you everyone for being here and sharing your great questions and engagement. If you could go to the next slide, um, you can find us at the SGSO network um, on social media and um, uh, on, on the web at www.sgsonetwork.org and feel free to email me at any time. Um, and then finally, uh, if you go to the last slide, um, we'd love to know what you thought about this webinar. The link to the survey is in the chat. Um, it also helps us to know what other um, uh, topics you'd like to hear about. Maybe you want to go a little deeper into some of the things that we talked about today. Um, but hope you enjoyed and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks for being here.